today's discussion is about digital disruption and the big data society uh, co-creating a better future. And this event is part of the Institute's uh, contribution to the Dublin Data Summit, which Adrian Harding here from the Department of Taoiseach is heading up. He's worked as Vice President at Intel Corporation, Director of Intel, uh, Intel Labs around Europe, where there was 30 research labs, quite an undertaking. And in that, he not only worked, obviously, in Intel, but he worked closely with the Commission on Research and Innovation and worked extensively with the wider research community. And I think that's been an enormous uh, contribution to research and innovation in that area. And Martin really is a corporate entrepreneur or, and innovator. I suppose people might use the word entrepreneur, but he has been really quite amazing in the work that he's done uh, on this whole area. He's written uh, over five books, been involved at advisory boards. I was just saying to him earlier, I don't know where he gets the time to do all of this. But I think one I'd like to mention, he's chair of the EU Open Innovation and Strategy Group, which is driving the future development and adoption of Open Innovation 2.0 paradigm in Europe. Martin, we really look forward to your presentation and thank you very much for taking the time out to come here today. Great. Oh, thank you, Joyce. So thanks for the kind words. I can't live up to that billing. And you know, thanks to Neil and Jill for the invite, and also Adrian. And, and the, you know, I think the summit next week, I think, is going to be a, you know, a very important event. So delighted to be here. Um, I have a lot of slides. I always believe that, you know, a picture will tell a thousand words. So uh, I'll do the digital revolution is happening very fast. So this literally will be a drive-by shooting of what I think is going on. Uh, if there are a couple of ideas that land with you, then I think it would have been successful. So I'll talk about there is massive change happening. Uh, you know, we have a choice, uh, you know, in industry and academia and society, we can either react to it and let it happen, or we can actually take control and proactively shape it. I'd like to argue that there is a new innovation methodology emerging. We, we call it Open Innovation 2.0 that can help us harness and these forces and this innovation methodology is difficult, diff different in that it actually is a methodology that actually has a purpose and it has a destination and the destination is all about sustainable and intelligent living. So it's about seeking innovations that basically can not only grow economic wealth but can improve quality of life and reduce environmental impact and you know de decouple resources uh, from, from growth. and. And in particularly, we think about the data summit. Also, want to talk about data, obviously, as the the new oil. And um, many years ago, I was privileged when Maura Gagan Quinn had her hearing at the European Parliament, where she was being quizzed by the MEPs uh, before she became Commissioner for Research, Science, Innovation. She said something really powerful, really fundamental. She said that knowledge is the crude oil of the 21st century, mm -hmm. and uh, that really stuck with me as one of those moments, because she, she has, has, has really nailed it. So we, we will we'll talk a little bit about data. So uh, it's about, what I want to talk about is, you know, how do we harness digital disruption, and you know, how do we shape and co-create a better world? So this is a big statement. Um, you know, I might be 20% right, or I might be 200%. <laughs> Right, but arguably we're seeing one of the biggest shifts that's ever happened in the history of, of the planet. And the reason I say that is that in the past we might have had one disruptive technology show up at, at, you know, at a time, it could be Tesla's system of alternating currents, which was just a phenomenal uh, innovation, or the internal combustion engine or the steam engine, and that drove a wave of economic wealth and societal change. But now we have multiple disruptive technologies all showing up at the same time, and this is really creating a chain reaction, a really accelerated chain. So what you might normally expect to happen in 40 years, we're seeing the dynamics play out in industry happens in, in seven years. So whether it be cloud, whether it be social media, whether it be the Internet of Things, machine learning, artificial intelligence, each of these on their own are very potent, potent very, very powerful technologies. But when they're used together, um, it's, it's almost an unstoppable force. And if you're part of that centripetal force, you get accelerated. Uh, but if you're not part of it, uh, you get left behind. And then all of a sudden we have something like blockchain show up. Uh, Don Tapscott talks about this as you know, the most fundamental innovation in computer science that has ever happened, distributed peer-to-peer -peer ledger. Now this is going to take some time, <clears throat> but it will change the world of commerce as we know it. It will change the, the, the world of trust. 
Uh, and this is probably this, it's kind of the next uh, internet. And then there's the next big thing, um, which if I knew I wouldn't be here, I'd be working on it, <laughs> but uh, that, that's not quite true. Uh, but one of the next big things is certainly robotics is going to be huge, but this is a humanoid robot called Pepper, developed actually by Aldebaran in France, and SoftBank acquired this uh, technology a number of years ago. And this is something that is, is going to be game-changing as well. You know, lots of trials going on with with Pepper in, in Japan in terms of elder home care. At MasterCard, we've been using Pepper in Asia in, in, in some restaurants. And all this adds up to a perfect storm. So Brian Main has a great quote, and he says, you know, when the winds of change blow, you can either build a wall to keep out the wind, or you can build a windmill to harness it. And this conversation is very much about building windmills to harness uh, this force. Arguably, the Internet of Things is potentially the biggest disruptor. And what we've seen in the last 10 years or so, the, the cost of computing has gone down a factor of about 40 times. The cost of communication has gone down about a factor of 30 times. The cost of sensing has gone down a factor of about 2x in the last 10 years. But with advances in nanoelectronics and nanomaterials, that's set, set to change. And this is making, you know, it's, it's, it's completely changing the game. And I think the big in the or the Internet of Things will be the biggest uh, industry in the history of electronics ever, uh, but that impact will be dwarfed by the changes it will drive in virtually every other industry, be it education, be it manufacturing, be it transportation. Uh, so we now will have the possibility of actually having you know roads and cars where no accidents ever happen. We just have to decide to to to, <coughs> to make that happen. Um, but as we think about in the context actually of the data summit, um, most of the data that's been created thus far has been sort of people generated, but the machine to machine data that's going to be created is just going to completely dwarf. And I'll, I'll show you some figures in terms of what's happened over the last couple of years in terms of the data explosion, but we're just at the start of this revolution. But the idea that the Internet of Things can bring you know, high precision, you know, closed loop, high frequency, um, systems to societal systems that previously ran in open loop. So think of being able to monitor air quality in Dublin every square kilometer and be able to, you know, and look at traffic congestion as well and actually do a real-time optimi optimization where you <coughs> have a congestion charging-based system. You're able to change incentives to park and ride in real time. So you, you're able to optimize. So all of a sudden you have a system that runs an open loop and it's kind of managing by hope. Some planner 20 years ago figured out here's the best way to work and there's been some tinkering with you know, traffic light sequences, but all of a sudden that could be managed as a, as a closed loop system. So the Internet of Things will be very big. Then there's the Kodak moment. Why did Kodak fail? Kodak, of course, mm -hmm. and you know, Polaroid jointly invented the digital camera. <clears throat> and you know, in the, the same year that Kodak went into Chapter 11. Instagram was acquired for about a billion by Facebook with 19 employees. So lots of companies are going to have the Kodak moment. And um, we actually talked about this briefly at the lunch, some, some research from Mark Perry in the US and the University of Michigan. At, you know, the current churn rate is Standard & Poor 500. So 75% of the companies that currently are in the Standard & Poor 500 won't be there in, in 10 years. That's a phenomenal a rate of change in <coughs> household names, you know, so there's a 75% risk that an Intel, a Microsoft, a MasterCard <coughs> won't be there. Of course, there's data as well, more data coming out that, you know, the companies that are digital leaders then are more profitable. And let's not forget borders, you know, household name, we probably all had a cup of coffee there or bought a book there and um, people today actually, I have a French colleague that works for me, he's never heard of borders, it's just completely obliterated from, from memory. So as we think about how we react to this, um, there's a traditional European view, you know, Niels Bohr, very sort of distinguished physicist, he said prediction is difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> so we can kind of, you know, sit and wait and figure out what's going to happen. Or then there's the West Coast view, uh, Alan Kay, um, not as well known as Niels Bohr, but potentially in the future he was the, the author of something called the, the Mother of All Demos and was very heavily involved in, you know, development of the mouse and graphical user interface. So the best way to predict the future is to invent it, or I like to say to invent or to innovate it or co-innovate it. And I, I think this is the posture we have to take. We obviously have to respect the past, uh, but we really have to, you know, take take charge here and try and proactively create the future that we we want to uh, live in. So I'd argue that there's a new primordial soup um, emerging, and this is actually bound by digital. 
it's enabled by digital and actually the mechanisms of knowledge and energy transfer and of actually building in this new primordial soup are, are all digital so it's a virtuous uh, circle so in this primordial soup we have governments we have universities <clears throat> we have companies startups big and large and we have citizens and users I think the, the whole app economy, and I'll talk about that very briefly, is a very good example of that. This is a, a, an industry that barely existed 10 years ago, and now is you know close to 50 billion by 2020. Um, you know, projections it'll be 100 billion. Um, so digital and um, is is connecting us all in a way that completely was impossible. And I want to share a couple of different patterns of of disruption, and, and patterns are a core piece of what I want to talk about today but you know how, how does um, digital innovation uh, happen and, and how can we increase the probability of success so i think this is 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 the new world and the green dots are users and citizens that are engaged in the innovation process and the red dots are citizens or users that aren't yet engaged but have the potential to be engaged and uh, last year i was delighted to be approached by nature to write a piece on open innovation 2.0 what are some of the core principles and that was quite well received, and I want to share some of those principles in, in, in the talk now. And so I don't know if anybody knows who, who this gentleman is, um, but it's, <coughs> a, a, um, it's um, a younger looking Gordon Moore. And I had the privilege when I was at Intel many year, years ago, I was promoted onto what we call the um, extended um, ESM. And my very first meeting actually was a privilege, Mark Andresen, who was the father of Mosaic. He was the guest speaker, and he was actually probably the inventor of the first um, cloud computing uh, company. I'll talk about Mark later on. He, he spoke there, but I was kind of, you know, young and I was just sitting down to have my lunch on my own brown bag lunch and Gordon Moore just wandered over to me and we started to chat and we talked about my new role. We talked about the Intel strategy in, in industry and incredibly um, genuine, incredibly non-ego. The, he's the, the antithesis of kind of the Silicon Valley, you know, sort of big ego and a very, very generous man. But he wrote a paper in 1965, uh, which came, turned out to be, you know, very seminal. It was about crowning uh, more transistors onto integrated circuits. And that became, <coughs> it became known as Moore's Law, but in fact, it is actually a repetitive challenge. And everybody in the semiconductor industry basically lines up the suppliers, you know, the Intels, the AMDs, the universities to actually make Moore's Law happen. And that's, a, you know, the transistor density has doubled every 18 months and that's delivered at lesser equal costs. And there's been, you know, incredible sort of consequences of that. And of course, there were other laws around that. Gilder's Law talks about, you know, bandwidth tripling every, every 12 or 18 months. But if we sum up all the impacts, I think something has fundamentally changed. The unit of competition has changed. So first, it's changed from the organization to the ecosystem. So it's no longer how good Microsoft is or Google or Intel or MasterCard, it's how good our, our collective ecosystem is. It's no longer about the product, it's about the platform and platform defining, do we have a set of standard components that other people can build on and, and, and co-innovate and why Apple have been so successful and Android has been so, so successful, there's a whole ecosystem of developers around them. And we've gone from a linear to, to non-linear world. I mentioned earlier that we'll see 40 years of change in the, in the next seven years because of the ecosystem dynamics. Mm -hmm. And in, just in software development, you know, we've gone from a waterfall model to, to agile. So I think you know, the unit of competition has fundamentally changed and companies or even institutions that aren't thinking like this, I, I think will become part of Mark Perry's statistics. They, they won't exist in the future. <clears throat> so I mentioned in my, in my introduction the idea that um, innovation, open innovation 2.0 was a little bit different in that it actually was an innovation methodology with a purpose. And the purpose is a fabulous uh, slide from UNEP, uh, which talks about the ability to not just drive, find innovations that drive <coughs> economic success, but also improve our quality of life, uh, but reduce environmental impact <coughs> and decouple resources uh, from, from growth. And I think this was aspirational in the past, but I think this is now potentially a reality. E.F. Schumacher, he, he wrote a book many years ago called Small is Beautiful, and I think that really fits actually the, the, the whole metaphor. So we use two quotes from Peter Diamandis of um, the Singularity University, and this is a very powerful quote, I think. It says, when something is digitized, it begins to behave like an information technology. So if you digitize an organization, mm -hmm. you digitize an asset, you digit a digitize a country, you start to see exponential behavior. So you could actually have exponential growth and potentially just 
linear consumption of resources or linear cons or, you know, growth of headcount. And similarly, you know, he says, um, and I think this is re written with Peter Kotler as well, technology is a resource liberating mechanism. It can make the once scarce the now abundant. I think both of those statements are really powerful and I think underpin uh, what's going to be possible in the future. Uh, design patterns. Uh, Seneca, he was a sto stoic uh, Roman philosopher. You know, he said many, many years ago, he said, the way is long if you follow rules, the way is short if you follow patterns. And as I think, it <clears throat> think about digital disruption, if you're an organization, institution, country, you can't wait around to follow the rules. You actually have to take the shortcuts and the patterns. And we're starting to see a very strong signal emerge from the noise. There are well-defined patterns of digital disruption and you know the winners will be or the organizations that actually follow those patterns so i want to share um, some of those patterns we we call them design patterns so that's mm -hmm. a, something that's an 80 percent um generally reusable solution that then is 20 percent customizable uh, for a particular environment arguably innovation is about to give up its secrets and you know innovation is not well defined like mechanical engineering mm -hmm. or civil engineering or even medicine where it's well codified um, innovation is still very much a black art, but I think we're getting close to the threshold moment where some of the core patterns uh, are emerging and we're starting to talk about uh, pattern language for Open Innovation 2.0 and next week in Cluj we have the fifth uh, Open Innovation 2.0 conference, it's, it's, uh, it's in, in Transylvania and we'll start to share in a little bit more detail what are, are some of the core patterns or the core, the first words or the first vocabulary of this new pattern language. Let's define digital then, so if we're going to look at the, the patterns, so this is the definition that we, we have used at Minute and uh, now at MasterCard Advisors, so it's innovation with and the use of in information and technology, and we split information and, and, and technology to improve human organization, ecosystem, and arguably societal performance and, and quality of life. So it's about information and technology, not sort of as a composite, but, but separately and together. Mm -hmm to improve performance and quality of life and leveraging the synergies of you know, information economics, silicon economics, software economics, and network economics. All of these are powerful on their own, but when they're combined together, they're very, very powerful. <clears throat> so this is um, a slide that uh, Henk van Houten from, he's the CTO of Philips, uh, used to explain the pathways of the digital revolution. And these pathways are still being explored, but I think it's you know, really seminal in terms of the changes that happen First you have a shift from analog to physical, then you go from a single function to integrated multifunction, and then you go from a single system to systems of systems. And, and you know, the example that Hank uses to illustrate this is what happened in photography, it went from analog mm -hmm. to digital. I really feel sorry for the mm -hmm. manufacturers of these uh, you know, uh, small digital cameras, exquisite engineering, mm -hmm. really, really beautiful. And all of a sudden they're eclipsed you know, because somebody figures out how to put a you know, high quality f um, um, camera onto a phone. And then we have this whole ecosystem of digital proposition that emerges and we talked earlier about you know, Facebook acquiring Instagram for a billion when Kodak were, were shutting down. I think this really describes what can happen and where the value is migrating to um, in a particular ecosystem. <clears throat> so fundamentally at Open Innovation 2.0, it's about in terms of actually trying to create a, a shared vision. So we talk about shared purpose. You start with a shared vision, uh, you try and articulate what might be the shared value. You know, over lunch we talked about the quadruple helix innovation, that when you get government, industry, academia, and particularly citizens aligned around a core vision, you can drive structural change far beyond the scope of what you can do on your own. So, if you can articulate a shared vision, uh, you then can figure out what the shared value is. I want to give uh, you know, one example of, of this at work. You're well on the way to driving stakeholder value and shared value. Uh, you have, there's an enormous amount of stored value. There's latent potential in an ecosystem. You have to figure out how, ca how can you unlock that shared value at risk. And of course, you need to have shared values. Uh, everybody coming to the table actually has to have shared values, um, thinking win-win mindset rather than uh, win-lose. So, um, the best example I can think of of a shared vision is John F. Kennedy saying, we'll put a man on the moon and bring him back safely. And you know, the whole country aligned around that. And there's a famous story about the janitor that said, when he was asked, well, what's your job? He said, well, I'm working to put a man on the moon. Very powerful. And Michael Porter has been talking about the idea of shared value for a number of years, particularly in the context of healthcare systems. <clears throat> so the idea we could reconceive the intersection of corporate performance and societal um, uh, value. So here's a real-time case study 
Um, it's one that's happening in, in Ireland. And these changes don't happen overnight. This is something that's probably about four years into a 10-year you know, transition. And it's a group of companies and organizations that came together in Ireland to see how um, Ireland could be the, the leader of something called the internet in, in demand response systems. And here's the, the idea of the shared vision, a world leading uh, demand response capability developed and demonstrated of, on the island of Ireland and exported globally. And this is an idea that uh, Bob Metcalf, who is the CEO of Treecom, is the inventor of the internet, he popularized in the US, but he really got fatigued with, he could get no traction. So I, I called Sean O'Driscoll in Grand Diplex when I was at Intel. Sean, I think we, we potentially should have a go at this. And I actually contacted um, Bob Metcalf. He's very gracious, very supportive. So gosh, I'm all behind it. If you guys can make a success of it, you know, you can put my um, uh, name behind it. So five or six companies came together in Ireland uh, in, in 2013. And we had all of the constituents that are sort of part of the, the energy grid. We had the transition system operator, distribution system operator, one of the big utilities, Intel and Glen Dimplex, who are actually the world's largest electrical heating uh, company. And we got behind it. We, you know, every six or seven weeks, we'd have the CEOs and general managers meet. This is one of our meetings um, uh, when I was at, at Intel Labs Europe. And uh, we got behind this uh, big idea. And we had to work together to actually figure out what's the, the shared value. This is a tool from Alexander Osterwalder, Business Model Canvas. But we had a couple of working sessions and we were able to actually figure out a model. Well, how could we create shared value for everybody, for the users, for the DSO, the TSO? And we were actually able to articulate a vision of uh, how that might happen. Uh, we, we came up with a narrative. It's very important that you actually have a narrative associated with it. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into the the narrative. But what we've been able to do is steadily, you know, scale this. And, and today, we you know we went from initial pilot of two homes. We had seven electric vehicles in in Roebuck Downs in, in Clonsky. And today there are um, about 1,250 homes across Europe, Latvia, are in Germany, Latvia, and Ireland that are actually trialing this technology. And the user is really at the centre of this. So we have all parts of the quadruple helix and UCD are now heavily. Um, involved with this. So this is uh, probably four years into a decade-long journey, uh, but this solution developed in Ireland actually is a, quite a good candidate to become the dominant design mm. for the future grid um, in Europe. And uh, this is kind of what the technical um, solution uh, looks like. So let's talk about what are the, some of the common patterns of digital disruption. Uh, here's six of them. There are many others, but these are six that I think are very common. Disintermediation, distribution, which I think is incredibly powerful and totally underrated. Uh, democratization, dematerialization, deceptive displacement, and demonetization. So I'll just give you some, some quick examples of this before we go in and talk about data. So I came here by Uber. They made things very simple. I talked to the taxi driver, said he, he loves this, it's very efficient. So in the past, there were six steps getting a taxi, it's now down to three, and it's just convenient and it's it's cheaper. So why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you use it? Uh, I'm still a fan, actually, of paper books, but many people really like you know, what Amazon have done with Kindle. Again, six steps have gone to three, and it's instant and, and real time. So this is a very good example of disintermediation. Distribution, incredibly powerful. Uh, in the past, independent software vendors, their big issue was distribution. How could they scale? They might have great products. Now there are a couple of really well-known platforms where they can put their products up and if they're good enough, they'll actually scale you know, uh, globally. Here are some of the statistics, you know, 4 million apps, 8.7 million app developers, more than 25 billion in, in revenues, as I said earlier, on track to be a 100 billion uh, industry by 2020. Another example, Airbnb, biggest accommodation provider in the world and yet they own no, no rooms. Fantastic example of the sharing economy. Mm -hmm. So it's another pattern of of digital distribution. <coughs> Tesla, phenomenal uh, story. Um, you know, sell a tiny fraction of the car, the amount of cars that GM sells every quarter and they have a bigger market cap. But one particular story, last year there was a recall, they had a problem with a, a plug and they were able to do, you know, by 20, no, no physical recalls were needed and they did, you know, 25,000 uh, upgrades, you know, over, over the year to cars. So, Distribution has changed. A couple of years ago, Henry, or no, Bill Ford, he at uh, Mobile World Congress, he was one of the mm -hmm. keynote speakers, and he said the car was part of the network. I thought that was you know, very, very fundamental. 
Um, deceptive displacement change initially happens very slowly and then all of a sudden when you look at a decade, mm -hmm. so you know, Expedia, YouTube, etc., the shift from physical to digital value capture in all these industries, you know, it's in the after 10 years, it's, you know, each year it's one to 6% change, but that becomes cumulative. And by the end of the decade, 50% of the value has shifted. Today, 50% of e-commerce in the US is on Amazon, which is absolutely uh, phenomenal. So I work in the financial services industry and we're just at the beginning of, of, of this journey, but we're, we're starting to see, see some of the changes. This is some re in terms of de democratization, some data from uh, Microsoft. It's a little bit old, kind of, as usual, but it's from 2010. But a couple of things that are interesting here. They estimated in 2010 the worldwide power consumption of servers was almost equivalent to the energy output of, of Poland. But if actually those servers had been in a you know, in a, you know cloud, there would have been a massive reduction in, in energy. Uh, so thinking about the green economy, there's a massive opportunity. Uh, but their analysis, you know, for small agencies and departments, it's 40 times cheaper to provision and you know, buy your service from the cloud than actually provision it yourself. And for larger agencies, it's it's 10x. But this just shows how everything is being democratized. Um, compute power communications power, even a decade ago, that only the large companies could afford or large governments could afford, is now available to everybody. And here's some data from Amazon. You know, the numbers are you know staggering in terms of if you use AW. As, you know, what are the typical types of returns you might expect on, on your investments. And then dematerialization, and the best example I can think of is, is um, uh, I don't want to you know, advocate a product, but Cisco's telepresence and, and sort of the imitators. And a number of years ago, I had the opportunity to have a call with John Chambers uh, using telepresence. I was like being in the room, and I would have willingly hopped on a plane, gone to Silicon Valley for an hour to meet John Chambers. But we were able to have the meeting and you know, he said in a meeting, listen, I've just, this is my fourth call around the world. I've just been on to India, blah, blah, blah. And I think it's a very good example of, of dematerialization at work. This is incredibly powerful in terms of demonetization. And by demonetization, I mean two things. Things are getting really cheap, uh, much cheaper than they were. Almost there's an app for everything and it costs, uh, it, you know, it costs a dollar. And then there's demonetization in MasterCard in particular. We have an agenda around the old world beyond cash and it's around your know, digital money, but it's also about financial inclusion. I think this is a staggering piece of data looking at sort of um, <clears throat> sequencing costs are actually dramatically um, outstripping Moore's law. Uh, so we're really on the cusp of uh, you know, an era of precision medicine now. There is a gap between, you know, in terms of, you know, what, what does that mean? You, you have the, the information and translating that into a, a prescriptive remedy uh, but this is incredibly exciting. So demonetization, mm -hmm. things that used to be, you know, prohibitively costly, are much cheaper and available available to everybody. So, as we think about the the world, I think there there are these patterns, and we can look at an ecosystem. We can look at a scenario. Okay, well, what pattern applies here? Is it disintermediation? Are we going to the change distribution? Is it about demonetization? Uh, so some, some attributes of digital, and this is based on some work by uh, Nicholas von Zeebrook from, from Belgium, a professor there, and I've added in actually Malibu. So digital is so potent because it's programmable. It's, it's becoming thinking as we think about mach machine learning and artificial intelligence. You know, <coughs> at some point, uh, we're going to approach the singularity, uh, which is that point in time where human intelligence and machine intelligence are equivalent, and you know, some machine will pass the Turing test, and the Turing test essentially is you'll be interacting with something uh, on, uh, on the internet, and you won't know whether it's a human, and some of the bot technology is approaching that. And I think actually at the last event here, somebody said, you know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a fridge, right. and yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but digital is exponential, it's interactive, it's mm -hmm. becoming ubiquitous, and it's totally malleable. I think this is really, um, you know, powerful. So building like this, it's very difficult to repurpose it, but digital, it's so small. And with virtualization, you can shift workloads all around the, around the world, actually. So if you have a data center and the wind is blowing or the sun is shining in Alaska, you can move the workload to there. So, um, so I think there are some attributes of, of digital that are quite unique and make it really potent. Uh, so this is the science bit of the slide. Here are some of the six of the core patterns uh, that we see are emerging in terms of, you know, what are the inner workings of this new digital innovation. This is based on six or seven years' work at the Open Innovation Strategy Policy Group, where we've been surveying you know, best practice around the world. So 
I'll call them out. Um, first, you, you need a platform. You need an ecosystem. Uh, you need to think about designing for adoption. Michael Schraes has a beautiful quote. He's a uh, you know, fellow at MIT. He says, innovation isn't in innovators innovating, it's customers adopting. So it's all about adoption. So thinking about adoption, and I have one or two examples uh, of this. Agile production. Everybody is talking about agile. Of course, it's mm. hugely important. Um, it's not rocket science, but it is hard to do. So you need to have a a agile production mechanisms in place. And increasingly, every product is, is digital. You know, the last estimate saw a car. It's more than forty percent uh, digital and software. Tesla is is way higher, of course. Industrial innovation, providing the context and a vision for strategic innovation. Actually, thinking about innovation as a manufacturing capability is hugely important. And I think there's some very simple things you can do to actually achieve that. And then lastly, and we're going to talk about uh, data-driven innovation. Uh, and the output, is, of course, is hopefully more profit, more prosperity, more progress, which you can never guarantee success. I heard a talk from Jim McGuinness once at a CIO talk, the ex Donegal manager, and gave a great talk. And the point I took away was actually you can't guarantee success, but what you can guarantee is the probability, higher probability of success. Yeah. If you practice, 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 mm. when that ball comes and it's a man and man, a woman and woman challenge, mm. you might might have the aid. So what we're saying in Open Innovation 2.0 is we can't guarantee success, but by following these patterns, we can increase the probability of success. And if, if you look at these patterns, so each of these patterns has six, di six different elements. Mm. So there's there's at least 36 different components that actually need to actually work yeah, together yeah. to actually have successful innovation. So mm -hmm. there's actually lots of you know, room to, to fail, but actually when you get successful, it's completely multiplicative. It's not an additive. It actually, yeah. you get you know, synergy. So we'll talk very briefly about some of these patterns and, and, and then I'll uh, finish. So The Economist uh, recently, this was the cover of the world's most valuable resource, and you know, Anita Kusa data is a new goal. I mentioned you know, Commissioner Gagan Quinn, uh, knowledge is the crude oil of the 21st century. In 2009, actually, Eamon, you helped uh, launch this book um, in the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, I wrote a book with um, Professor Thomas Anderson from Sweden and uh, mm -hmm. Piero Formica from Italy. It was about knowledge driven entrepreneurship. And the central thesis of this book is that in the 20th century, much of the wealth came from electrification and you know, carbonization, but in the 21st century, uh, most of the wealth creation is going to come from knowledgeification, uh, from managing knowledge flows. If you look at Google, Amazon, you know, Apple, Facebook, Twitter, uh, I think this is, is, is coming true. And uh, you could, you know, an interesting infographic here, too small to read, but how the tech giants make their billions. And of course, Apple have got exquisite design, and you know, Amazon have brute force and a lot of courage. But it's all about the ecosystem and, and particularly the data, monetizing data. So what we're seeing is, you know, smartphones are continuing to grow, but actually the interest in the year-on-year -year rate is, is declining. This is a, you know, a, a really nice um, infographic about our expanding information universe. I think there's some parallels between the expanding physical universe and the expanding uh, information universe. But virtually every category each year we see, you know, what's happening in an internet minute, 500 hours of video, updated or uploaded on YouTube compared to 300 a couple of years ago, uh, similarly on, on, on WhatsApp. And I think the comparison between WhatsApp and Vodafone is really staggering in terms of mm -hmm. revenue per employee and, and, and reach, etc. So I think the message is uh, that smartphones are going to continue to grow the rate is, 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 is slow, uh, but more and more information being, being created. And, you know, the outlook is by 2020, you know, 6.1 million smartphones, uh, but that will be dwarfed by 26 billion connected devices. So right now, humans are the big source of data generation, but in the future, it's going to be dwarfed by machine to machine. So here's the pattern that looks at um, data-driven innovation. I just want to give some, some really simple examples, but some of the core patterns that we're seeing, so just simply generating insights from data. Data already exists. It's latent there, and actually use some, some, some tools to actually figure out some value. Yeah. Augmenting products to generate data, digitizing assets, increasing the information intensity of products, and if you look at a Tesla or even a Jaguar Land Rover, um, as, as more stuff is put into the car, there's, there's, there's more you can do, and you know, we're not too far away off from autonomous driving. Combining data within and across industries, imagine being able to take sort of, you know, Tesco's database of you know, what's selling on a public health database and just smash them together. I think there will be incredible insights in terms of the impact of nutrition on, on, on public health. 
And then, of course, trade data, uh, which is you know, very top of the line at the moment. And then lastly, we have closed loop uh, control systems I mentioned earlier. If you have, say, microclimate data, uh, air quality data in, in Dublin, there's huge, or in any city, there's a lot of much you can do. But let's see just a couple of examples. Uh, one of the earliest examples of just you know, creating value from the forecast, two values in Seattle, I think it was uh, 2008. Uh, they were looking at the airline data and they actually figured out the patterns, you know, when would be the best time to buy a ticket if you're traveling from Seattle to Chicago. Uh, Microsoft bought it for 112 million and those guys were, were happy at it. Today, everybody has this kind of capability. So I think it's a very simple example of, you know, two smart guys, a lot of data, and actually generate a lot of value for users and a lot of value for themselves. Uh, I like the cycle. This, I think, is another you know, simple example we have a bike. We put a digital odometer on it, it's actually quite useful. But then we actually combine it with the phone, and there's a whole new sort of ecosystem of you know, propositions, and uh, that's, uh, that's, that's great. Here's an example that's 50 years old. Uh, Rolls Royce, I think last year, uh, celebrated you know, 50 years of power by the hour. Uh, it was initially, initially invented by Hawker Sidley. Uh, but the idea, because the engine is so instrumented, instead of selling an aircraft engine to a cash strapped airline, the sell hours of both time. Um, and it's turned out to be very powerful. This is data from the economist up to 2010, where you can see that services that you've grown from being relatively small products now more than 50% of the revenues of Rolls Royce. So I think this is a great example of actually digitizing an asset and then using it to, to, to change your business model. I think the great thing is that uh, this technology it was only available to Rolls Royce and GE. This kind of technology is available to, to everybody uh, today. Thinking about innovation for adoption, again, there's a pattern for adoption. So, and too often, many new products actually fail these tests. So, um, you know, is it going to be reproduced? Is it usable? What's the usability? What's the user experience like? Utility? Um, what's the uniqueness and is it designed for use? Uh, so I don't think anybody would argue actually the, the smartphone has become incredibly sophisticated, you know, Swiss Army knife. But this is a historical example. When I worked at Intel, uh, we shut down our MP3 player uh, factory two weeks before Apple launched the iPhone. <laughs> uh, so we were there two years before, which had all the same ideas, but Apple were successful. And this is how Intel it looks actually pretty crappy to be honest compared to <laughs> the iPhone. But this is the Intel marketing, which would buy 128 megabytes of built in memory for 10,000 songs in, in your pocket. So uh, I think that certainly uh, really you know, tells the story. Uh, here's some examples uh, from Dolan. The concept of living that and having users involved in the innovation processes is hugely important. Uh, when I was at Intel, we used Dolan in London as, as living labs. But we put these devices, you might recognize this is down by the Trinity uh, College, and we put these devices uh, into the streets, you know, looking at sensing air quality and microclimate. But what we found is they weren't robust enough to withstand winter storms, and also there wasn't enough uh, sunlight to power these devices. So in March, these devices, they worked very well, fine in Santander, but in Dublin, they didn't work very well. So we learned and we reiterated. And this is um, what the city or the borough of Enfield uses in the UK. It's a picture it took a number of years ago. And this is the prototype device. We replaced this device uh, with this small device hanging on, on the wall here. And Enfield actually had a big air quality problem. They only had three of these devices uh, in the borough. But for the same cost, we were to put about 100 of these devices uh, in the borough. Uh, these devices are offline, so we had to drive around and stick in the USB stick and hold the video. And uh, now Enfield um, you know, had, had real-time air quality and could make you know, much better planning decisions, etc. Now, the interesting twist in this story, Intel could productize this, but in the spirit of open innovation, it, was, it doesn't fit with the, the business model, etc. And there's a very large German audience now, which are now going to bring this product to the market. Uh, I'm going to finish with a few slides. Uh, Mark Andreessen, he was the founder of Mosaic, so that you know, the common, common browser. He famously wrote that software is eating the world, and I think there's a really good way of describing you know, that how the world's laws colliding basically with every, every discipline. But APIs, application programming interfaces, until about six months ago, these were just kind of in the domain of the, the software developer. Uh, but increasingly, this is becoming a whole room and discussion. And in the future, arguably, everything will have an API. This table will have an API. The chair will have an API. Now, that, that might sound a little bit far-fetched, and maybe it is. But 
APIs are going to be the scale engine of the digital world, particularly when we have machine to machine uh, collaboration. And it's critically important. We talk about the user experience uh, for users, but the user experience actually for developers will be very important in terms of the adoption uh, of, of APIs. So I think as we think about digital disruption, APIs are going to be a massive piece of APIs for services, APIs for data, APIs for security, APIs for uh, digital identity. So, uh, last couple of slides, uh, we had a discussion over lunch on this, so the question, you know, did Apple or, or governments create the iPhone? And this is some research from Marianne and Lindsay Gathers recently from Sussex to UCI. A uh, brilliant piece of work that she does some analysis So look at all the core features, you know, what Apple, so governments, you know, mainly DARPA and some of the US agencies, but also CERN and you know, EU funding contributed. Now, Apple threw in some genius and some courage. Mm -hmm. But most of the fundamental work for the iPhone actually came from, from government funded work. And um, Marianne argues that government really is the hero of innovation. And I think it's another piece of evidence that for us to succeed in the future, we need to put your beliefs, government, industry, academia, and citizens working together uh, around shared vision. So the knowledge economy, beautiful quote from uh, Lady Deborah Amadon, who passed away in the last year or so. She said, The knowledge economy is <coughs> not about having more. It's about being more. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about the experience economy, so it really is about self-actualization, amplifying you know, human collective intelligence in, in a way that's environmentally sustainable, economically equitable, and socially responsible. This is a, a quote from The Economist in 1996, so you know, 20 years ago, and it still holds true that economic theory has not moved forward. Economic theory has a problem with knowledge. It seems to defy the basic economic principle of scarcity. The more you use it in Macedon, the more it proliferates and it's infinitely responsible. What is scarcely new economy is the ability to understand and use knowledge. And 20 years on, nothing really has changed. If you look at Google, you, know, you can only explain 15% of Google's market cap by physical assets they have. And they, you know, the gap procedures actually don't, can't explain why where the rest of the market cap is. So we do need you know, economics and discipline to actually hurry up and you know, keep, keep pace. Um, and what I'd argue to finish the digital and open innovation to one will really create this opportunity to create a, a new future, uh, one that you know will be totally sustainable, uh, more equitable, uh, more environmentally uh, friendly. And I wanted to finish with a quote that's 45 years old. Uh, you're going to read it and say, gosh, it was true then, but it's even truer today. It's found in the book, The Limits to Growth. Uh, from Dennis and Donald Telemetals, and they even said, man possesses for a small moment in time the most powerful combination of knowledge, tools, and resources the world has ever known. He is all that is physically necessary to create a totally new form of human society. One will be built to last for generations. The missing ingredients are a realistic long-term goal or a shared vision that can guide my time to the equilibrium society and the human world to achieve the goal. And I would say actually the technology is almost it's not you know we saw the British Airways this disruption, you know, technology is still fragile, it's not it's not fully sustainable. And some of the work we've been doing at the New University and the Innovation Value Institute is building capability and maturity frameworks and understanding when we look what does it take to run, say, world class IT for an organization like PA or the Irish Government. There are we've identified 35 critical capabilities that need to be managed all very well. Just three or four of them actually are about managing the technology. The rest is around governance, around enterprise architecture, risk management. So, so this is it's complex. So not only does economics, this one of economics need to keep up, but IT management actually needs to keep up so that we can harness this great opportunity. So uh, I think we have an incredible opportunity uh, ahead of us collectively. There are it's fraught with risks. You know, man versus machine is not a, that, that debate is, you know, we have to have that. Way. But I think we can be successful if we proactively take charge and create a vision of society that you know, we want to live in and that our children and their children's children. So, thank you.